Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. You guys ready to dig in this morning? All right, turn to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and in particular, Uh, Chapter 3 is where we are this morning, and we're going to be going through verses 13 through 18. I know in your handout it may have said 14. That's a typo on my end. Forgive me for that. It's verses 13 through 18 this morning. As you guys are turning there, um, we began last week in uh, chapter 1 just to give us an opportunity to be able to see what Proverbs is all about. And then uh, in Proverbs 3, I think Solomon does a great job here of showing us why we need the book of Proverbs. Or more specifically, I should even say, why, why does wisdom even matter? Well, for one, cards on the table, right? Like, wisdom matters because truth be told, we need it, right? Like, I need it. And I, and I would hope all of us would be able to with humility say, I I think I need wisdom, right? And in particularly, I'm talking about the wisdom that we can gain from God's Word. That's not to say that there isn't great or good things out there that we can find that are helpful to us, but primarily what I'm, I'm thinking about is the wisdom that the Bible gives to you and to me. So for one, I, I need it. And secondly, wisdom matters because Y'all, now there could not be a, an even greater opportunity for those around us to not only see but hear of God's wisdom from those who are redeemed by Jesus. They, they, need to, they need to see and hear wisdom from the church. Our city, whether it's here in Ringgold, whether it's in Fort O, whether you live in Chickamauga, or whether you cross the state line from, from Chattanooga in East Brainerd or Rossville, you, you name it. The world around us, the people around us need to be able to say, if I go to Brainerd, North Georgia, I should be able to find a people where I can see and hear them living out the wisdom of Jesus. Where a broken sinner can find hope of how they can in fact be redeemed and live with wisdom. Like I would hope, I would hope that Brainerd, North Georgia would be that kind of a location where you and I can be able to shout to the rest of the world, here's where you can find wisdom. Furthermore, right, to make a point of this, I love what Ray Ortland says. He says, wisdom is how life works. If you want to see how life, in fact, operates and how God designed life to operate, you can simply go to the pages of Proverbs, but don't just stop in that wisdom literature Look in Ecclesiastes, look in Job, look in Psalms, and you can find how, how wisdom shows us how life works, right? He goes on to say, importantly, we can, we can disregard for a while and get away with it, like the wisdom that God has given to it, because God built everything so well. But we want the last chapter of our lives not to be filled with foolishness, but rather to be filled with wisdom. Right, like nobody woke up in the morning and said, I cannot wait to make a fool of myself today. Like nobody does that. So if, if we want our last chapters of our lives, of our days, to be filled with wisdom rather than with foolishness, then wisdom matters, doesn't it? Now, you may say to me, well, Paul, okay, you, you made your point with that, but is, is God's wisdom that valid? Solomon, who was one of the wealthiest individuals that ever, that ever walked this earth, would tell you 
that God's wisdom is a treasure above all else. In fact, that's the main idea that he wants to communicate to every one of us from the text that we're going to be looking at this morning. And if, if that's true, then the wealth that we have in front of us, the very word of God, the very wisdom of God, is something that we should not only say that matters, but man, we should treasure it and pursue it and find as much of it as we can. Because if it is a treasure like nothing else on this earth, then I would hope all of us would say, give me wisdom. Now, don't believe me? Let me show you why I believe that's in fact true right from the very word of God. So read with me, beginning in verse 13 of chapter 3 in the book of Proverbs. And it says this, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, And the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels. And nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, those who hold her fast are called blessed. What a treasure. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, God, that you declare yourself to be wise. And you don't say it without substance or without being able to back it up. Your your words hold weight and your wisdom is proved. So God, we pray as a church family that you would help us to be wise. Not because we can find it in ourselves, but we're humble enough to be able to look to the pages of your word And shout and declare to you, you, God, are wise. So God, I pray this morning that through the very means of your word and the work of your Holy Spirit, that you would help, that you would encourage, that you would convict, that you would even challenge. And I pray that you wouldn't even help me, God, as I deliver your word this morning so that it could be clear and so that we can see your wisdom and so that your son Jesus can shine brightly off of these pages. Help us all, God. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let me give you guys the roadmap for this morning, all right, on how I believe that that God's wisdom is a treasure above all. And it's a treasure because, one, it is better than fine metals and jewels. Secondly, it shows us a better way to live. And then lastly, it is the way to true blessing. All right? Now, before we get to the last one, as always, we have to begin with the very first point. And let's begin there. And me showing you how God's wisdom is a treasure because it is better than fine metals and jewels. The section here that we're covering begins by saying, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Now, the beauty of God's wisdom is that it is available to anyone and everyone who chooses to lean into this wisdom and say, that's wise. I should acquire that skill. I should do that. In fact, it doesn't say blessed is the Christian who finds wisdom. It says blessed is the one. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians ought not to read this and that Christians should not benefit from it, but the truth of the matter is God's wisdom operates in this world where it is a common grace to anyone and everyone who says, I'm going to apply that. So God says anyone and everyone could be wise if they choose to humble themselves and read my word. But most importantly, to believers, you are one who is blessed if you find it and if you get understanding. Now, that word blessed gets thrown around a lot in Christian circles. It's it's another word that's worth defining so that we're all on the same page, right? Blessed 
what that word means is one who experiences life as God intended. In other words, God desires for us to experience the benefits of how he intended for us to live based on the wisdom of his word. The way that God wants you to live is based on you applying what wisdom he has given to us from the Bible. That's what being blessed means, right? This means that we should not be surprised that if we live according to God's wisdom, we will reap wisdom's blessings. Now, let me explain, okay, because this is not hashtag blessed or, you know, the blessed bumper sticker on your car that says, I'm blessed. This is not what, <laughs> that's not what Solomon is saying here, okay? Think of this for just a moment. Have you ever found someone that is slow to speak and quick to listen? Where somehow or another, you often find this individual who is in less conflict and in less miscommunication precisely because he chose to hold his or her tongue and listen rather than quickly speak. You ever find somebody like that? Or have you ever learned that hard lesson <laughs> of, of just listening, like cards on the table, me as a guy, I miss the obvious and I don't listen very well, right? This is a very convicting aspect of what it means to live in wisdom. But I'll tell you, I will reap the benefits of the wisdom that God gives in his word if I simply just listen to what my wife says to me, right? And all the ladies said, there you go. If you don't believe me, there's the proof for you, right? Have you ever seen somebody who is diligent and disciplined with their work and you often find them excelling in their position? That should come as no surprise that Proverbs often speaks that laziness does not lead to productivity and effectiveness, but rather discipline and diligence leads to even profit or even the benefits of what it means to constantly be working hard, right? Again, Solomon here tells us this is wisdom applied. This is how you're blessed, the way that God intended you to live, right? Now, Solomon tells us, do you know how you can be blessed in that way? He says in the very verse that we just read, find it, get it. In other words, this is his invitation to say, here's wisdom, now go after it. Right? What he's not saying is that wisdom just simply happens by osmosis. Just stay there. God, give me wisdom. That's not how it happens, right? Like, like you, need to, you need to search for it. You need to go after it. You need to read. You need to spend time in God's word to acquire the wisdom that he's given to us. It is our active pursuit of his invitation. Get wisdom. Find wisdom, right? Now, notice what happens and what, it, what he says in light of us finding that wisdom and how valuable it actually is. And he does some comparisons here. Notice what verses 14 and 15 say, right? It says the following. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Now, this is really neat what Solomon does here because he has now personified wisdom. In other words, this is Lady Wisdom speaking. He's pointing to Lady Wisdom. And now, this is so neat of Solomon to do this because what Solomon's doing here is writing this as if he's writing it to his son. And, and what could be more captivating than beautiful Lady Wisdom, <laughs> right? And so, as a father, he's saying, see how beautiful she is. And notice everything that she affords. Notice everything that she gives to you, right? So Solomon, in his wisdom, right, teaches us that wisdom is far much more superior to material wealth in two ways. First, it is more profitable than silver and gold, 
okay? The, the words that we need to pay attention to is gain and profit, right? To, to have something to profit from these precious metals. Silver and gold, as we know, are, are rare and valuable. And they're not just gifts of beauty from God, but they have and they serve a purpose even today. Like we use gold for modern machines to conduct heat and even use it for electricity. But yet here the point is that though gold and silver, as valuable as they are, cannot compare to the wisdom of God. And so he, he simply says, gold's good, silver's good, they're beautiful, man, but lady wisdom surpasses them all, right? Secondly, it is more precious than jewels, right? The key word there is precious, which means that it, a jewel, a diamond, for example, carries weight, right? In other words, something like a diamond is rare and durable. In fact, it's one of the strongest gems that we have on earth. It's hard to scratch. It's hard to break. There, there is a weight to it. It's, it's precious, right? Once again, Solomon emphasizes here the value of wisdom compared not just to precious metals but to precious jewels such as diamonds. And he shouts to all of us and he says, to do you want something both beautiful profitable, purposeful, and durable that stands the test of time, then get wisdom. Acquire wisdom. Go to God. Find wisdom. In fact, to drive his, his, his point home even further, Solomon even says what he says in verse 16. Notice what it says. It says, long life is in her right hand, and in her left are riches and honor. Solomon says to us, God has promised to his very own people, do you want to live a long life? Then live according to my wisdom. Do you want to flourish in life and prosper, then follow my wisdom. There is a natural, general circumstance that happens to those who say, I'm going to lean into wisdom. Now, let me explain what I mean here, okay? Because what Solomon is not talking about here is some weird form of prosperity gospel, okay? This is not what he's talking about. In fact, like I mentioned earlier, like you cannot read the book of Proverbs without also reading Job, Ecclesiastes, and Psalms. That's wisdom literature, okay? And here's why. If we just read the book of Proverbs, we think that this is some magical formula that we put together, and it's an equation, right, that if we do these things, then all these things are going to happen, and we're not going to experience pain, hardship, or difficulty in life. Can I give you a theological word for that? It's baloney. We will experience those things, right? It runs completely against that idea of some that say that God will never give you more than you can handle. Again, a theological word for that, baloney, right? That's not true. These principles that, that Solomon writes here are general principles in life, that if you do these things, by and large, your life will be blessed in this way. In what ways? Listen to me. If you don't act foolish in life and you follow the principles of God's word and you don't go against even the very laws that we have in this life or you don't do things that harm your body, guess what? You will live a long life. Right? By and large as a general principle. If you do the things that God has asked you to do from his word, guess what? Your reputation will precede you and you will flourish in this life. In other words, Solomon here is simply just saying to those around us, here's my invitation to have these things. But then what the rest of the books in wisdom literature like Job or like Ecclesiastes and even Psalms teach us is precisely what this commentator says. 
Money can put food on the table, but not the fellowship around it, right? It can buy a house, but not a home. It can give a woman jewelry, but not the love she really wants. In fact, he would go on to say that wealth may be the reward of wisdom, but not the goal in life. The, the, The wisdom literature that we have balances things out to help us understand how to not only live the way God wants us to, but not get it twisted to think that, that things happen in this life because we live in a Genesis 3 broken world. It gives us the wisdom that we need to live the way he wants us to, 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 to flourish, but not to get it twisted in our lives. Here's one of the ways that sometimes things could get twisted for all of us. You and I, especially knowing the principles that we've read here, And what I've said is that we will constantly have to fight against the temptation of materialism's false promises. That you and I are constantly always bombarded with the next new thing and the next improved thing, right? Don't have the latest iPhone, you need to get the latest iPhone. Don't have it with AI, now you can have it with AI, which freaks out a lot of people and immediately they're thinking Skynet, that's what's happening, right? You always... Point being, feel the pressure of having the next thing. Only to have to remind ourselves that the shine will stop shining and the stuff that we get may make us happy for the moment but will never truly satisfy like Jesus. When we strip away all of the things that we have in our possessions and even realize the good gifts that God has given to us aren't compared to him or wisdom, then we will truly begin to worship the giver of those gifts rather than the gifts themselves. Gold and silver, they're good. Jewels are beautiful, but Jesus is infinitely better than all of those things. And that's the point that Solomon is trying to make here. Solomon tells us, hey, the treasure of wisdom doesn't stop with fine metals and jewels. God's wisdom is a treasure because, secondly, it shows us a better way to live. Notice what verse 17 says, quickly here. Verse 17 says, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. First of all, wisdom's ways are beneficial to our lives. In other words, God's wisdom adds to our lives rather than take away from it. The Hebrew way of understanding this word pleasantness is the word kindness. Now, now, mind you, this is amazing what Solomon does here because he's already established Lady Wisdom, right? So you can kind of picture her. One commentator defined it this way. All of wisdom's ways that guide you are filled with kindness. Right? Think about it this way. Have you ever met somebody who is very considerate? Like, have you ever met someone that they, they simply go out of their way to help you whenever you need something, or they lend a listening ear to whatever may be happening in your life, or that person always seems to be there even when there's something difficult that you have to do. In fact, it's the person that it's mind-boggling, sometimes mind-melting, that they remember everybody's birthday. You're like, how do you do that, right? They're like, Paul, use calendars. I'm like, oh, that's, that's one way of doing that. There's Facebook. Oh, there's that thing. Gotcha. Either way, point being... It's, it's the kind of individual that you, you reap the benefits of their kindness. They're pleasant not just to be around, but they model what it means to lead you in that way. Solomon says, that's lady wisdom. Do you want to reap the benefits of what God's wisdom gives you? Spend time with lady wisdom, and you will find that spending time with lady wisdom is pleasant. That's what he's saying. Secondly, wisdom brings peace to our souls. The word peace, again, it's one of those other terms that really gets used a lot in Christian circles. And again, it's often very good to define it. The word peace in the Old Testament is the word shalom. Okay, And the word shalom means completeness. Many times, right, when we think of peace, we think the absence of conflict, 
right? Like, if you're like me and you're like an Enneagram 9, like, I love the absence of conflict, right? I don't want to be around it. It stresses me out. I will run from it. Like, me, my mind, like, I'm like a placid lake. Like, I just don't want, if ripples happen, I'm like, I'm gone. See you guys later. I'm leaving. Like, I'm not, I'm not, like, that's just me. I often have to fight against that and lean into healthy, good conflict. That happens. In fact, that's, that's, that's how I have to engage even within my marriage. I often back away from conflict, and I need to engage within healthy, good conflict, right? We often think of it as just the complete absence of that, but that, that's not the only thing that peace means. Biblical peace means much more than just the absence of conflict. It means the presence of something as well. This is why peace in the Old Testament means completeness. Let me explain, right? Like, think of it this way. Whenever there's like a missing piece in a puzzle, and it's the last piece that you need to complete that puzzle, and you can't find it, it's somewhere in the house. Good night, where's the, where's the puzzle piece, right? And you finally find it, and then you place it where it needs to go, that's shalom. It's complete, right? Think of it this way. David, whenever he went out to the battlefield, when the Philistines were warring against Israel, he went up to his brothers with a sack lunch, and he's basically saying, how are you guys? And what he's asking about is in the midst of everything that's going on, inwardly, are you complete? Is there shalom? And clearly they could not answer that in the positive because they were not. Clearly there was conflict. There was was a lot of stuff. But even within that conflict... David stands as a picture of shalom. Why? Because his trust is in the Lord even in the midst of conflict, right? Think about it this way. I love how Tim Mackey puts this together of relationships, right, and how complex they are. Ever feel it in your relationships when they're out of alignment or when there's conflict or when things just seem like they're out of place? It's like, it's like feeling like there's an incomplete puzzle piece in your relationship. And until that puzzle piece is put in that relationship, you won't feel that sense of completeness. Things need to be restored as they should be, but without it, it can't. Now, like, spoiler, if you're missing that piece within your soul, because you know that there's something absent between you and the Lord. The puzzle piece is Jesus who is the Prince of Peace. He's the only one who can solve that incompleteness in your heart that longs to have a relationship with God. And he's the only one who can meet that. He's the only one who can change that. He's the only one who can give you that. Why? Because he's the only one that can solve the great dilemma that you and I have, and that's sin. And the chasm that that has created between us and God. Friend, if you don't know God as your prince of peace, let me, let me encourage you to go to Jesus and find him as your prince of peace. And he will offer that to you, right? You and I not only can find that kind of peace to, to have a relationship with God, but Solomon basically says here to you and to me, if you're wondering how to navigate this thing called life, and you're constantly asking yourself the question, should I do blank, and what you need is peace, he says, I can give that to you. Right? Ever been in one of those situations where you're wondering how on earth am I going to navigate this next season in my life, and what you're begging for is not just guidance, but you're asking for peace. Peace in the midst of uncertainty, peace in the midst midst of questions, peace in the midst of like, what are we going to do next? God offers that. Now, you may wonder, really, like, come on, Paul, like, does wisdom really show us a better way to live? Well, think of it for just a moment. How often have we trusted in our own wisdom and allowed even something as simple and minute but significant as our tongues to get the best of us? Right? We said more than we needed to say only to wish that we had taken back the words that we did say. And what did it create? Conflict. 
right? How often can we look back at our younger days only to realize that we did some pretty foolish things that got us consequences that we really didn't want, right? Like, if those things are true, then where else can we go to that can really truly give us the peace that we need and what's more, to really benefit our lives other than the very wisdom of God's word, right? Not only... Is God's wisdom a better way to live? But y'all, God's wisdom is a treasure, thirdly, because it is the way to true blessing. Now, if you've checked out and you're like, whew, man, that's been a lot, welcome back. Hi. Um, this, if, if you ever wanted to check back in, like, this is the time to really check in because this is where, where everything really begins to click and you see the beauty of the wisdom that God gives to us. Notice what verse 18 says. It says, she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Now, listen, if you're a student of God's word, there, there's a word here that if you, if you saw it, you see the beauty of how this is written, right? The very last word of verse 18 is the word blessed. And the very first word of verse 13 is the word, okay, this is the audience participation part, right? right? This is where you guys engage with me and I engage with you, <laughs> all right? The last word in verse 18 is bless, and the, verse, the first word in verse 13 is bless, right? Which goes to show, it, it, Solomon's just shouting to us just by how he bookended this. You want to know how to be blessed? Then do everything in the middle. Appreciate everything in the middle because that's the point, right? These blessings, first of all, how do you acquire them? How, how do you have blessings like that? They come, first of all, by laying hold of wisdom. That's what the text says. That's what verse 18 says. Laying hold. Now, what on earth does that mean? It means to embrace or to grab onto. Right? Like yesterday, we celebrated my daughter's eighth birthday. Her birthday was the seventh, but we went ahead and had the birthday party uh, yesterday. And what we did is we went to Warner Park over in Chattanooga to the pool. And it, First time I'd ever been there. It's pretty cool. Very crowded on a Saturday for sure. Um, but nonetheless, the girls had a, a great time. It was awesome. And there they have this obstacle course that you can try to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm in the camp that if I attempt to try to do this thing, the first thing that comes to mind is cell phones. Right? Like everybody's just popping up and they're just taking pictures. Like I don't want to look crazy on this obstacle course and just fumble all over the place and look ridiculous. Like I don't. But... Pride is a thing, and I want to do it, <laughs> right? So sure enough, my wife comes up to me. She goes, you won't do it. You can do it. I'm like, mm, all right, I'm going to go after her and do it, all right? So I go over there. Now, don't tell her I said this because she was in the first service, but she, she went first, and I watched her, right? And, and there's this little platform at the beginning, and she, <laughs> she tries to jump on it. There's handles on there. And, man, she's trying, trying. She flips that thing over. She's underwater. She, she did not start off very good. It was, it was funny. All right, don't tell her I said that. Don't tell her. Don't tell her I said that. But I go over there and I try. Now, that platform is there for a reason, and it's got a few things that are helpful for you. They're called handles, right? And all you do is reach over and grab them, right? And hold on to them so you can secure yourself and pull yourself up, right? Now, that's not to say I did this expertly. Right? That's not what happened. Like, I still had a hard time trying to get on this thing. And then I, I, I fell. Like I ate it later. It was bad. Point being, Solomon here is saying that's what it means to grab onto something. In other words, this is what makes you stable. This is what keeps you sturdy. You wanna, you, if you ever want to hold on to something that's firm, grab onto wisdom. Right? Like that's what he's saying. But secondly, these blessings come by holding fast to wisdom. Right? It's not just grabbing it. Now, if laying hold means reaching out and holding, then holding fast means being unwavering and resolute. Like, have you ever met somebody that stubbornly won't let something go? Like, this is the good kind of stubborn that you want to have. Right? That you're just, you're not moving. Why? Because I want wisdom. Solomon tells us that a person who lays hold of and holds fast to wisdom, guess what? They're blessed. Right? Like if you're ever trying to figure that out, that's where it is. Now, quickly, I know, I know I'm running over time. 
Now follow what Solomon is saying here. Solomon compares wisdom to the tree of life, which represents and is the source of eternal life. In other words, the very words of God, his wisdom leads to eternal life. Now, riddle me this one, Batman. Okay, now follow me here for just a second. Do you know where the words tree of life are used in the Bible? They are only used three times in Genesis, in Proverbs, and then in Revelation. All right, now, now, y'all, I can't make this stuff up because it's God that did it, right? Like, follow this for just a moment. In Genesis, God establishes himself as not only the giver of life, but the very source of life itself. And he shows them that through the very tree of life. Now, Adam and Eve here had a, had a choice that they had to make. Would they follow wisdom and heed God's word and have this life, or would they choose to disobey? Now, we all know the story, and as it goes, by their hubris or by their di disobedience, not their humility, they chose to say, we don't want it. And so what happens? They lost access to the very tree of life. So when does it pop up again? All the way back in Proverbs here where God says, I want to show you wisdom. And I want to show you how you can actually have eternal life. Like this is a hint where God is saying, do you want to know who I'm going to send as the greatest form of wisdom? It's my son. And then later he would dawn this earth and show us the very wisdom of his salvation. In fact, he would be wisdom personified. And then later in Revelation, specifically in chapter 22, you know what Jesus does? He, he restores what was taken away because of our disobedience. Now then showing us once again the source of eternal life. Like, y'all, this is beautiful. And to anyone and everyone that wants to believe in Jesus, there's your source of life. He's showing it to you and to me. So, listen to me. I know that's a hefty claim. And everything I've said would be a fairy tale or some other New York Times bestseller on a shelf at Barnes and Nobles in the self-help section. But it's not. The truth is that it's not just a fairy tale that you have to go back and look for in the empty tomb section at Barnes & Noble. Last time I checked, it didn't have a section like that. But there is a section in Israel that has an empty tomb proving to you and to me that what God has to offer, he can. Why? Because he is the very source of life. If Jesus wasn't alive, y'all, this would, as I've said before, is just another weird form of therapy. Where I'm up here, y'all are done here, and y'all are asking me questions. But that's not what this is. We look to Jesus as the very source of what we need as life. So, friend, listen to me. If you've been walking around, you've been thinking to yourself, man, good night. I do not have that kind of wisdom in my life. Then can I continue to point to you, to not only the Prince of Peace, but the source of life that can give you wisdom and can save you. And then, believer, True blessings come from a humble heart that desires to say, I need this wisdom. Why? Because it is a treasure above all else. Would you go to it? Would you run to it this week and say, I need this wisdom? Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for you and deeply thankful for your word and what it shares with all of us. I know for myself, I am often leaning into my own wisdom. I don't often at times admit it to myself, but I know that I wake up at times saying, I've got this thing figured out, I'm good, and I may not say that out loud, Lord, but I do that. I do that by not spending time with you in silence and in solitude and in prayer and in your word. My Bible at times looks really pretty on the shelf and not on my hands as I'm opening the pages, reading and listening and gleaning from you. 
And for those moments, God, forgive me and help me to see the treasure that I have right before me. And God, if there's anyone here that resonates with me when it comes to that, God, I pray that you would not only shower your grace upon their lives to not only forgive them, but God, give us all grace to enable us to be able to go to you, to look to you, to pray to you, to see how much your wisdom matters for us. God, help us when we fail. Help us when we have acted foolish and make us people who live in wisdom for your honor and for your glory. Help us, God. Give us what we need from you. And we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said...